last but not least speaker, so Simon Webster from NEC. Um, so, so Simon is the uh, NEC or NEC Submarine Networks uh, Director for EMEA. So another, again, so another vendor, you know, and kind of also to kind of from your perspective to understand how do you see the connectivity landscape developing and uh, we've heard one perspective and we'll see whether the presentation kind of confirms uh, some of the presumption assumptions there about increasing capacities and decreasing costs and and uh, this uh, pretty you know complex but optimistic landscape so please uh, simon you know floor to floor to you now thank you very much uh, can you hear me okay we, uh, yes we do thank you okay so thank firstly thanks very much for the opportunity to present uh, to you today um, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in, in Sinesh but uh, uh, I hope the, um, the whole event is a great success I'm sure it will be. Uh, I call my uh, presentation that we need more cables <clears throat> now I think um, some of the uh, previous speakers have already answered that question in the, in the affirmative but I'd like to give you a maybe a slightly different perspective on uh, uh, on this issue. So those of you of a certain age will remember the device uh, at the top here, and that's a dial-up modem, um, giving you as much as 14.4 kilobits of internet access capacity. Um, but at the time that was kind of manageable because websites were simple, uh, email attachments were small, video content was minimal if it even existed. Um, but of course, over the last 20 years or so, then uh, broadband speeds have increased greatly and so is overall net network traffic. This is a kind of virtuous circle where user behavior drives capacity demand and fulfilling that capacity demand drives user behavior by, for example, allowing app developers to come up with new ideas. So the latest craze in the app space tends to generate ever more international internet traffic, particularly if it's video based. And now of course, 5G is expected to launch a new wave of bandwidth hungry applications. Also, fiber to the home rollouts are reaching users now in areas further from uh, centers of higher population density. So we can expect new technology, new content, and new users. I guess the question is, does that necessarily respond, or doesn't translate into new cables? Well, let's take a look at the supply side of the equation. Um, firstly, the uh, the minimum achieve uh, the maximum achievable transmission capacity per fiber pair is constrained um, by the well-known Shannon law, which has been mentioned before, uh, and this gives the theoretical capacity of a channel for a given signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, <clears throat> advances in in terminal equipment uh, mean that uh, we are leading towards generation of transponders, um, which approach or get, get ever closer to the Shannon capacity uh, for a given cable. So further innovation in transponder technology is of course possible, uh, but large, large capacity gains are becoming harder to, to foresee. So another direction we could take is to increase the number of fiber pairs in a cable. Uh, we're at 24 fiber pairs now and expect to go to 30 something uh, soon. Um, going beyond that uh, packing density of fibers in a cable may may imply thicker cable, but that kind of bucks the trend over the last 20 years or so to reduce the diameter of lightweight cable cords. Um, so also a larger cable means more materials and more cable ship loads. But a, a real constraint um, seems to be electrical powering. Um, most telecom cables today are rated at a DC voltage of 15 kilovolts. Um, adding more fiber pairs means that maximum voltage requirement could be reached or that maximum voltage could be reached on longer systems. Now there may be ways around this um, by splitting the powering of a long segment if there's a convenient island on which to place a power feed, um, but that's not, obviously not always an option. So a capacity limit is approaching unless um, cable purchasers give up on the capability for single end feeding. Um, is that likely? Uh, spoiler alert, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I don't see that as, a, as an option, at least in the short term. So 
What about other technologies? Um, we could increase the available spectrum in a fiber pair using the L band, the long wavelength band, um, but that really doesn't solve the powering problem on longer routes. Could be a definite option for regional systems, but longer systems, um, this, the power problem remains. There's been a lot of work on multi-core fiber. Um, whoops. Hang on. Um, that is, um, it kind of falls into two broad categories. Um, the first where there are two, three, or maybe four cores per fiber. And in that case, they're spaced far enough apart um, such that the, uh, they are independent of each other. They don't interfere. The second category would be um, one with fiber with more cores. I'm, there's a seven core fiber shown here. Um, but those signals interfere with, it, with each other. They're, they're close enough to interfere with each other. Um, this type of multi-core has the potential to be disruptive, I would say. It offers a large increase in capacity, not just two or three times, but it would need a, a new generation of terminal equipment to sort out, to descramble the interference between the cores. Um, that kind of problem has been solved in the radio world, um, but those guys are working with carrier frequencies 10,000 times lower than the optical world. So um, signal processing for them is that much more manageable. Uh, and, oh, another issue for multi-core, of course, is whether the fiber manufacturers are actually motivated to go down this route. Because it means that um, putting more cores in a fiber mean, may mean that they end up making less fiber, manufacturing less fiber. That's still to be, still, still to be uh, sorted out, I think. And then we've got quasi single mode fiber. Um, they've been looked at where the core uh, of the fiber is large enough to support a few modes, um, which in theory could carry separate signals. Um, again, these modes are not independent of each other. So a lot of signal processing would be required at the terminal end um, to compensate. Hence, again, another generation, new generation of, of terminal equipment, SLTE. Now, some of these technologies may have application in regional systems, but again, all of these um, seem to fall short of being power efficient enough for transoceanic cables. So in summary, um, there are technology limits in sight for the dry plant. Um, if capacity demand continues to rise at current rates, then technology solutions for the wet plant um, may be insufficient in the medium term. I'm talking five years, uh, that kind of time. And so for that fact alone, um, that points to more cables. And that's even before we consider things like uh, the, the demand for diversity of routes and new landing points, um, the necessity to avoid interaction with fishers. Uh, again, that points maybe to new routes in some areas where uh, fishing fleets are moving. Um, you want to make, maybe consider new routes to avoid interaction between the cable and uh, fishing gear. And um, the avoidance of the need to avoid emerging seabed users, such as deep sea mining contractors, offshore energy uh, companies, and so on. So that's my summary of the situation. Um, and I think it's positive for the industry in that we will, uh, I believe, continue to, continue to see significant demand for the new cables. So, so, so thank you for your attention. Thank you for so listening. Thank you very, very much. And so again, probably then similar kind of angle than before, how sustain, you know, so we see this growth now, we see this will be growing more and you say there's more cables will be needed. How sustainable it is? Is it a long term trend or is this now, you know, how do you see that? I mean, I can really only reiterate what Paul said just now. You know, uh, we we have a, a an industry which is, has historically been um, cyclical, um, but as far as we can see, uh, again without the proverbial crystal ball, um, demand seems to be constant um, and and high. So it's impossible to be one hundred percent certain, of course, but um, uh, we certainly see a pretty steady demand over the next five to seven years. Great. And then in terms of a cost, uh, cost tra 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 trajectory, you know, also was discussion there and 
you know, so was it, uh, so do you see the costs kind of continuing decreasing or decreasing at least as drastically as it was before? The previous speaker mentioned is like 2,000 times per bit per second, you know, in, in the last uh, 20 or odd years, you know, so do you see that will continue or this is also will hit certain laws, if you, if you may say, as we like to kind of in our industry? Well, I think the the trend is certainly towards decreasing cost per bit, and that's certain, that is that is a, a real. I mean, that, that's the main game in town, really. That's that's the, the target uh, for most large scale cable owners. Um, I, I think there might be slight nuances um, to that motivation, depending on the precise business model. So, if your business model is involves a commercial cloud offer or selling wholesale capacity, um, your submarine capacity or spectrum or fiber pairs um, have some intrinsic value. If, however, your business model is really to replicate content across data centers and then uh, offer that data uh, for access by the end user for free, then your submarine assets are a pure cost. So in that case, I would imagine that the motivation to drive down cost, it must be extremely high. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? It's like, so I think with that, thank you very, very much, Simon. Again, My so, pleasure. thank you. And with that